Anyway, what remains of the necessity for destruction, for radical ideological and ideational dismantling? How do we avoid being caught up in that phantasmatically descriptive, descriptively false, practically effective, because so brutally ideological assertion of the end of ideology that Daniel Bell made 60 years ago? Daniel Bell, McGeorge Bundy, George Kennan, Hannah Arendt, and Samuel Huntington were part of the first and still dominant wave of anti-wokeism. And the fact that they all did it from a position that then and now most people would describe as liberal must be noted and analyzed. The perils of a kind of emotive, anecdotal rejection of corrosive wokeism, when it is understood to have taken its most virulent form in late adolescent Afro-pessimism, is that it is usually accompanied by recrudescence to the forms and procedures of democratic demonstration and administration, which in the wave that begins to roll with Bell and crests with Huntington and his fellows is all about demarcating and enforcing limit on demos with biopolitics and biopolicies, residual enactment, enactments and claims upon sovereignty. At stake is what will have occurred in the frontier between two problematic questions. How will the people rule themselves? How will the people be ruled? Pieties regarding the slow productivity of the seminar, which the teacher must still husband in semi-divine invisibility, or in Pierce's fantasies that confuse intermittences of friendship, sympathy, and regard with the loveless convergence of interests that more properly define and comprise political coalition, continually relinquish the capacity empirically to imagine and practically to sustain the sociality that is the substance, I believe, of what Professor Wilder names and desires under the rubric of concrete utopianism. At stake is what he, after Ellison, calls the boomerang of history, those uncanny, untimely ways that every instance of supposed emancipation created conditions for a new form of racial dom the domination. That's a quote not only for African-Americans, but for the entire global array of African and Afro-diasporic peoples, you know, which is the, the primary concentration of the, of the book, um, but, but Ellison comes in there too, in its relation to what Andaya, the great Afro-Guyanese feminist activist and theorist, refers to by way of George Lamming and Chinua Achebe as betrayal wherein liberatory aspiration and its material traces are stilled, exploited, and dispersed when, quote, those we nurture and sacrifice into power help not us, but our enemies. The kind of power into which intellectuals are nurtured and sacrificed must now become a matter of concern, not only at the level of what we say and write, but also at the level of how we gather and organize, precisely to consider the social physics, the ethics and ecology and erotics of thinking, gathering, organizing, and fighting. I just said erotics because I'm following behind as close as I can, right? But like <laughs> Professor Glover. Um, uh, if indeed it's still happening again, and that's a resonant phrase that, that, uh, that, that Professor Wilder's book repeats and echoes, if it's still happening again in the ongoing assault on black life, then how do we account for the ways that persistence and repetition are held in the very structure of our own thinking in the name of the defense and flourishing of black life? This question concerns the force of liberalism in the discourse of liberation. And it must effectively note the redoubling of that lingering recrudescence of the, it is still happening again, that had already tainted liberalism's resistance to authoritarianism, or if you'd rather, biopolitics democratization of sovereignty. But how can we move through the retreat to and review of the classics, which seems only right in lieu of the hurt feelings that the callous, hyper-individuated nastiness of the recently awakened pessimist induces? when what we need rather is a relentless probing of those classics with absolute and violent love in order continually to root out of them and of ourselves the residual sovereignties that animate the liberal anti-liberatory procedures of civil butchery. This is what Professor Wilder asks in and in the brilliant and elegant and searching airy edition of his asking, he models that more he models that more than mere retreat and review and return. But what remains then of the role and force of what might be called negation? I'm interested precise specifically in the status of a certain phrase, the end of the world, 
as well as with a certain critical stance towards the history and the promise of interracial coalition politics and with a certain analytic regard with, an, with a certain analytic regarding the constitutive force of a, under, of understand, uh, of a certain understanding of anti-blackness, all of which are now usually associated with Afro-pessimism. I'm not here to offer a defense of Afro-pessimism or of its primary theorists, proponents, or adherents, and they would hate it if that's what I was here for. <laughs> no more than I am here to defend negative dialectics or post-colonial cultural theory. I'm here in the wake of Professor Wilder's <clears throat> needful uh, an elegant provocation, which is not an attack on these tendencies, but an extension to them of readerly comradeship and care, to pray uh, uh, and care. Um, but I am here to praise destruction. It's not enough simply to assert that destruction and engagement can be compatible. One would also have to show and continue to enact the history of their compatibility. To be against constructive forms of political engagement is not to be against engagement. The very idea of holistic vision requires us to consider deeply the semantic field or plane or plane that entanglement and engagement imply. What is it to imply? What fold works there or that? But what if there is no politics or political science or theory or theology of entanglement? Rather, what if there is a physical sociality and sociology of entanglement, which will have required a shift of terminology from the translocal to the non-local, just as it will have required this deep investigation of physical and ecological ethics of engagement in entanglement? What if a critical destruction of the metaphysical foundations of politics is inseparable from a constant concern with the ethical practice of engagement? This will have been a matter concerning the techniques of mutual aid, of improvisational curacy, as well as a matter of direction and attitude. What if the affirmative blow of the general strike is, in the first instance, proximate caress? What if betrayal is given in the instant of our comportment towards the enemy, which the relay between war and politics demands? What if we help our enemy precisely to the extent that we comport ourselves towards him in that instant of the desire for impossible recognition that is the essence of politics or political life, understood as the necessarily interracial intersubjectivity that concretizes and embodies the human in and for the regime of the concept? Students, rather than being scolded for their failures in liberal intellectual subjectivity, which are all traceable to accepting some status of victim to which they have been relegated by their teachers and the stuff they read, need support in how to figure out what their relationship is to historical and present victimization. Interracial intersubjectivity is a system for the production and distribution of pain. What, on the other hand, might be some good techniques for engagement and entanglement? Where does it hurt? Asked Ruby Sales. What if the beginning of the end of the world, which will have been the end of the self and the body, is given in this question, which is the first question, and in another, how can we make it feel good? Neither of which will have ever been directed towards the enemy. As Professor Wilder knows and shows, this will have been practice, not a game socio-aesthetic practice and not the game of honor.